لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم اجعله خالصا لوجهك الكريم لا ابتغاء سمعة ولا شهرة ولا رياء أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته ما شاء الله جزاكم الله خير so good to see you all again the Isha uh, is getting later and later Maghrib is getting late and Isha is Iqam is 9.30 so I know if I keep talking till 9.30, you will start throwing your chairs at me. So, so I won't do that to you. I won't, we'll try to finish at 9, inshallah ta'ala, and people can go back early to pray in their own masajid, or inshallah ta'ala. The Arabs have a saying, they say, the Habib al <laughs> They say, the Arabs have a saying, if your friend, if your beloved is honey, don't lick it all. You know, don't eat all of the honey. Leave some, inshallah. Uh, also, before I forget, uh, this Sunday, inshallah ta'ala, at 10 o'clock, I will be giving a seminar on Umrah here in the Masjid's Hall, in the community hall. Uh, those, I know some brothers and sisters are planning to go for Umrah and they have asked for a seminar on Umrah. So if you're planning to go, please uh, join us. And even if you're not planning to go immediately, maybe you're thinking about going later, you may want to join also to benefit from, inshallah ta'ala, uh, the talk or the seminar on Umrah, inshallah ta'ala. So that is this Sunday at 10 o'clock, inshallah, uh, after our Applied Islam class 9 to 10, and then we have 10 o'clock the Umrah, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyib, uh, last week we... Uh, uh, we saw how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca and began the Mubarak Hijrah, the migration from Mecca to Medina. And we saw how he, alayhi salatu wa salam, uh, when he decided to go and tell Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu of the Hijrah, uh, he went to him uh, midday, and uh, which was hot, which was unusual because we said that Aisha radiallahu anha said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to come and visit us in the morning or the, in the afternoon or in the two cool periods but it was, un, it was unusual that he came to us midday and you heard how the interaction what happened and then they decided to make migration to migrate and they left at night uh, quite in secret uh, they left at night so that nobody can see them and nobody can follow them and even they went the, um, the, a, a, to Medina through a path or a way that usually the caravans don't take so Rasulullah Sallallahu took every precautionary measure took the asbab, the halal asbab uh, and we will talk about this more in, in, in a second inshallah ta'ala and we heard how he alayhi salatu wasalam passed by the uh, the tent of Umm Ma'bad uh, because she became Muslim after and she didn't know this is Rasulullah Sallam she didn't know this is Abu Bakr <coughs> but when you think about it what a moment that was imagine if that was you in that tent and here is two special guests pass by you and, and none other than Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr and you, we heard how he asked for uh, something to drink or eat and she said we have nothing look at what we have all the sheep all the cattle we have is thin there's no milk and he alayhi salam when he put his mubarak hands blessed hands on the udder of the sheep it gave milk filled all the containers they drank and he left alayhi salatu wasalam <clears throat> when abu ma'bad came back who was out and came and he said where is this milk from and she then began, she gave the physical description of Rasulullah Sallallahu which we heard last week, beautiful description of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi who is the most beautiful of uh, people uh, that stepped on the face of this earth, alayhi salatu wasalam. And she gave that beautiful description of his height, of his hair, of his beautiful face, of his eyes, of the color of that, the depth, the deep color, black, blackness of the pupils of his eyes, 
the, the, the striking light of the whiteness of his eyes uh, and the way he spoke alayhi salam, his demeanor, his presence alayhi salam, that when she described this to her husband he said I swear this is the same man who is being talked about in Mecca now remember Umm Abad, Umm Abad they haven't seen him alayhi salam, until that moment uh, and this is, the ulama say this is the first time a, the physical description was given to us uh, about Rasulullah Of course, others gave his physical description. Ali radiallahu anhu gave his physical description. Al Hassan radiallahu anhu gave his physical description and many others. And with slight variations, but Umm Abad gave us this comprehensive physical description of the beauty of beautiful Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he alayhi wasallam is beautiful through and through in his physical appearance, in his akhlaq, in his character, in his dealings, in his wheelings alayhi salatu wassalam, gentle and kind, merciful and compassionate alayhi salatu wassalam. And, uh, uh, but when the going got tough in the battlefield, <laughs> nobody was like him. They used to say, the Hamiya al watis when the going got tough, we used to hide behind the Rasulullah sallallahu in the battlefield. So then when they left now, so they, they feel they, they've, they've had the milk and now they proceeded to go to Medina. Meanwhile, the people of Mecca became aware that Muhammad Sallallahu had left because he left quietly, as you recall, and he had Ali radiallahu anhu sleep in his bed, right? And so that uh, he left quietly. And and uh, by, by the time he had left the tent of Umm Ma'bad, the news had already been circulating among the tribes of Mecca that Muhammad and Abu Bakr had gone, radiallahu anhu. Uh, Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab took the opportunity and went to the house of Abu Bakr. They knew this is the place he would go to, right? When they heard, they went to the house. And Asma radiallahu anha was there and Aisha radiallahu anha. And remember Aisha radiallahu anha uh, later on uh, when of course she married Rasulullah she narrates this story for us. And so when the ulama say the, the, the participation or the role of women has been substantial and I will comment about this later. But she has she, uh, one of the hikmah or the wisdoms of Allah wa ta'ala of marrying Aisha radiallahu anha at a young age is that so she can return also the sunnah of Rasulullah and the ilm uh, of uh, deen uh, not only outside what was happening outside but more importantly inside also and that's why as you know after Abu Hurairah Aisha she is the narrator of most of the hadith about Rasulullah after and that is a mess, an honor that's why the ulama say Aisha, we know historically she was a faqiha of the first class. She was a hafidha of the Quran, she was a muhaditha, she was a faqiha. Aisha was, radiallahu anha, was perhaps one of the most significant women in the history of mankind. In, and, and we can comment on this later when, we, when, when, when Rasulullah marries Aisha, we'll talk more about that. So uh, these heads of the mushrikeen, they go to the house of Abu Bakr anhu, and who opens the door is Asma radiallahu anha. They say, she, they say to her, where is your father? She says, I don't know. She knows. But this is concealing and this is allowed. The, uh, this type of uh, concealing the truth in order to protect somebody who is a victim or somebody who is uh, op oppressed from an oppressor or from some type of tyranny. And so she said, I don't know. And the Mal'oon Abu Jahl, he slapped her actually. He slapped her. She said, he slapped me so hard. But she, even under that pressure, she would not disclose the information as to where her father, radiallahu anhu, and where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam had gone. And when they saw that they're not going to get anything out of her, she was a very young girl yet. She wasn't, uh, you know, she wasn't a senior woman. So you can imagine the strength of this young lady. 
and the, the belief in the mission of da'wah and she did not say anything and so they left and went the news as I said was going around and these mushrikeen of Quraysh of Mecca rather in order to catch Muhammad وسلم, they issued a prize and they said anyone who catches them we will give him 100 camels we'll give them 100 camels it's a big prize right especially and so they was vying and this is interesting because uh, they say the conflict between truth and false is abadi it will always be there and uh, often to try to diminish truth to diminish the light of da'wah the, 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 the mushrikeen and the people against Islam and deen, they will pay any price to extinguish it, any price to stop it. And the people with weak iman and weak hearts and whose, whose purpose in life is money only, they will fall victim to this type of temptation, the temptation of money for the sake of stopping haqq. And you see this happen in, nowadays in, 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 in the form of missionary activities. Billions of dollars are spent so that uh, Muslims in countries like Indonesia and Africa are brought back, uh, taken away from Islam. So uh, Rasulullah sallallahu uh, alayhi when, when, uh, when Asma did not give any names, uh, Rasulullah proceeded to go to, uh, to uh, Medina and when people began to hear of the reward of 100 camels, uh, one man by the name of Suraqa bin Malik, who was not a Muslim, he was a mushrik at the time, uh, he heard this. And he says, this is an excellent opportunity to become, <laughs> quite, you know, to become wealthy quickly with 100 camels. And so he said, I was sitting one day in a gathering like this, and somebody came and he says there is a reward of a hundred camels for anyone who catches, catches Muhammad وسلم, or Abu Bakr And the man who gave the news, he said to Suraqa bin Malik as he was sitting, he said, look, on my way back, I, would, I saw some people heading towards Medina through such and such di direction. Maybe it's them. Suraqa said in himself, and he's narrating this story because Suraqa becomes Muslim eventually. And he's narrating the story and his cousin is narrating it on his behalf who heard it from his father. He says, Suraqa says to himself, Suraqa bin Malik, he says, when I heard this man say he saw some people heading to Medina, I knew it is Muhammad and Abu Bakr. But I pretended it's not them. So I said to him, he said, no, 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 that's not them, mate. You know, don't worry about it. It's not them. No, you know. That can't be them, I mean, how do you know it's them? He said, but inside me, I knew it's them. He said, inside, I knew it's them. And he said, I waited a while. When the man left, I waited a while. And then quietly went to my house and I told my maid to get my horse ready and get my sword ready. But he says, when I took my sword, I took it and I lowered the sharp end to the floor so that it's because it doesn't uh, uh, shine with the sun uh, and so nobody ca nobody thinks that he is going for a hunt and he says I yani casually I went out uh, so that nobody can see because he wanted it for himself he wanted it for himself and he said I chased I followed them when I when I when I was out of sight out of sight uh, I went I rode my horse and I spent until, and I did not stop, until I saw them ahead of me. So now this is the first time they were able to catch up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr. He says, when I came close, I could see that Rasulullah sallam never turned his face around once. He was always heading forward because Rasulullah sallam Connected is <laughs> Yaqeen. I'm going to reach Medina. Allah's protection is there. But the, he said the man who was with him, Abu Bakr, كان يلتفت يمينا وشمالا. He was looking right and left, front and back, because his concern is the safety of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. رضي الله عنه. 
Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu. What a man. What a man. Radiyallahu anhu. Right. Uh, when in, later on uh, there were some incidents where people, something happened and somebody came to complain about Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu. He said, also Salam actually was very upset. He says, Utruku li sahibi. Leave my friend for me. Leave him. When everybody hesitated, when everybody hesitated, he never hesitated when da'wah came to him, radiyallahu anhu. as siddiq So, as Suraq bin Malik said, so I saw them, and I saw the Muhammad, alayhi salam, not looking around, but I saw Abu Bakr uh, looking around. Uh, but, and just before I came closer to them, my horse, and you all know this story, you, he's, you've seen it, you've heard it, I heard it. He says the, the two legs of my uh, horse uh, uh, immersed in the sand. And it would, it would not move. He says the arrows, what they used to have, they used to have an azlam. And these were tablets. They used to have some omens. The Arabs believed in, in, in superstition. And Alhamdulillah, Islam came and uh, eliminated this belief in superstition. And sadly, still some Muslims have this superstition, right? Which is not, which is haram actually. In fact, some of this superstition can, can border on shirk. You know, you hear this superstition, people say if a black cat walks in front of you, then such and such will happen. <laughs> in China, the number 13 doesn't exist, right? If you go into the lifts, is it number 13, the Chinese? Which number? Some number. I think it's 13. They, in their lifts, there is no 13 because there is superstition, a tashaun. Or so they say if there is a, a ladder, don't walk under it, something will happen, right? This is all superstition. Or so you see some people buy this blue, kharaz al the blue eye, you know, in Turkey, they sell them everywhere. And they put it in front of the house or in the car. This is all superstition. Islam, alhamdulillah, came. Islam told us, use this, right? And how, follow Allah and His Rasul, and that's all you need. For, forget superstition. And came to, it came to teach us yaqeen, certainty. In fact, it warned us again against shak and doubt even, and says, be certain in what you do. Right, and in fact, this idea of being certain and verifying the news and not believing whatever you hear, not believing superstition, and not only did it make Muslims advance so much in, in the dini sciences, in ulum al din the dini sciences, but in the worldly sciences. They questioned the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians because whatever knowledge that came to them, they say, we don't accept it because it simply came from Aristotle or Ptolemy, who were great scholars, uh, but we question it. We don't take anything on face value. Uh, so much so, as I said earlier, by the 8th century, Ibn al-Haytham wrote his book, Shukuk ala Batlimus, Doubts Concerning Ptolemy. Ptolemy was a big figure in the history of, of astronomy and cosmology, right? They had doubts. We won't accept anything that just comes to us. And sadly, you see nowadays, Muslims still believe in these superstitious things, right? And as you know, Rasulullah prohibited us even from reading the stars, you know. You know, the uh, horoscope. You know, people go and read the horoscope and say, what's your, what's, and they try to read your future by, this is all superstition, this is all un unacceptable, right? It is all unacceptable. And so what Surah Abil Malik did, he took out some of these tablets and he studied the superstition. He's, he's trying to see whether I should continue to pursue Muhammad Wasallam or I should not. Right, and he says, although uh, the reading of my, the reading of his, uh, his uh, uh, superstitious practice uh, led him to believe that he shouldn't pursue them, but he said, no, I pursued them. And he said, well, as soon as my horse was able to get out of the, the sand, I tried to follow him again. They, it, it went into the sand. Uh, and I could not. I simply could not approach them any f further. So I stopped and I called out. And I said, Oh Muhammad, I, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I will not harm you. I promise you I'm not going to harm you. I, because this is a sign. This is from Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is part of the mu'jizat of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the miracles which were specific to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we have to believe in. <laughs> if it is reported, 
in the Quran or the Sahih Sunnah, we have to believe in it. Even if the aql sometimes may not comprehend it, we believe in it. And this is a mushrik. And he, he felt it. He knew this. He knew, he said it. This horse is, has been stopped. It has been stopped. By whom? By Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Uh, then he said, when I met them, قَالَ وَقَعَ فِي نَفْسِي حِينَ لَقِيتُ مَا لَقِيتُ مِنَ الْحَبْسِ عَنْهُمْ أَنْ سَيَظْهَرُ أَمْرُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَقُلْتُ لَهُ إِنَّ قَوْمَكَ قَدْ جَعَلُوا فِيكَ الدِّيَّةِ إِلَى آخِرِهِ He said, when I met Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, uh, I sort of concealed in my heart whether I should tell him of why I had come or why I should not. But Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, already told him why he came. <laughs> he said, he said hey, your, your, your mission has failed, basically. Then he said to Rasulullah Wasallam, he said, uh, I have been, I came to, because there is a, 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 a prize on your head, a bounty on your head of a hundred camels. Uh, but I swear, I, 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 I have seen enough. Allah has showed me the sign and I will not pursue you anymore. Uh, and he said, interestingly, he said, when I told Rasulullah what the people of Mecca are doing and that they're planning to catch or catch, capture Rasulullah and they had put a bounty of 100 camels on his head, he said, Rasulullah uh, he did not ask me anything. He didn't inquire. He just, he didn't say, oh, tell me, give me more details, who is the person who, he know he doesn't need to know this stuff, alayhi salatu wasalam. Walam yasalni illa an qal. He didn't, he said, the only thing he said to, my, to, to me, ikhfi anna. He said, just don't tell them where we are. He says, that's all I'm asking you. Just don't tell them where we are. Uh, and the man said, I shall do that. Now, in, 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 in many uh, books of uh, seerah and uh, of uh, history of Islam, which is, uh, which is deemed as sound narrations, that uh, uh, it is said that Rasulullah said to Suraqa bin Malik, كَيْفَ بِكَ إِذَا لَبِسْتَ سَوَارِ كِسْرَى He says to him, listen to this, I mean, imagine the scene with me for a second. This is in the mid middle of the desert, right? <laughs> There's nobody there except Rasulullah, Abu Bakr, and this uh, Suraqa bin Malik. Now Suraqa bin Malik said, okay, I'm not going to say anything. I'll go back and quiet. And essentially, I'm sorry for even following you. I can see now that you are on the truth. Listen to what Rasulullah said to him. He says to him, how would you feel when you will wear the bracelets of Kisra, the emperor of Persia. He just, he just told him that. What does that mean? What does it mean? One, this man is going to become Muslim and he's going to wear those definitely. Secondly, Persia, which was the second greatest empire of the day, will collapse. I mean, look how and who, who told this to Rasulullah Allah Azza wa Jal. In huwa illa wahin yuha. He is, he doesn't speak from his hawa, alayhi salatu salam. And this is again of the, this, these are the signs of nubuwa. These are, I mean, alamat al nubuwa, these are the signs of the nubuwa, prophethood of Rasulullah sallam. I mean, you just think about it, imagine, uh, just, it's not like Rasulullah sallam sat there, and thought about what shall I say to this guy and tried to come up with something. It just came out. He just said to him, what, how would you feel when you wear the bracelets of Kisra? And it's like he said, he didn't, he didn't know what to say. He doesn't, know what, he doesn't even know what Rasulullah is talking about. But then if you fast forward, fast forward, and you come to the Khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu. It is said, of course, as you know, during it's uh, Umar during the Khilaf of Umar that they say he, bra he broke the backbone of the Persian Empire. That's why they still hate him until today. <laughs> Umar, I mean, you have to think about this. 
It's actually quite phenomenal. It's phenomenal. You think of Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, Al Jazeera Al Arabiya, right? Prior to Islam, what was their value in the grand scheme of politics of the day? Geographically or politically or economically? What was their value? Nothing. Yemen was more important than them. Right? Yemen was more important. Yemen was more fertile. Yemen was more prosperous. Yemen had trade routes with the Persians and the Romans. Yemen had a spiced trade route. Yemen had buildings. In fact, recently archaeologists found uh, remnants of the old buildings pre-Islam in Yemen. They said Yemen pre-Islam was like the New York to today. New York today, <laughs> right? But so. And Allah Ta'ala didn't choose Yemen for a prophet to come from. He chose a Nabi from the most arid and dry of places. <laughs> There's nothing there. They didn't have oil at the time. Right? And to the Romans and the Persians, Arabia was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. And their numbers weren't many because we know for a fact that by the time of Hajjat al Wada, there were about 124,000. Sahaba. Yani, we're not talking about millions. And now, after the death of Rasulullah, Islam, if you look at a map, you see how quickly within the first the period of Abu or the Khulafa al Rashidun, the rightly guided Khulafa, which lasted for 30 years, right? You see Islam already spread and uh, it went all the way into Persia, right? Into Syria, into Palestine, uh, into Egypt, into part of Africa. And straight after the Khalifa al-Rashidun, the Islamic civilization was knocking on the doors of, of, of France, of, 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 right? They had already gone to Spain by the year 711. That's not long after Rasulullah died. And they had gone to India, Hind and Sindh, they used to call them India and Sindh, by the year 711 also. They had already gone into Central Asia, and now they are in Europe. Right? And so when you talk about this small group of people who had come really from with nothing and from nothing, and suddenly by the time of Umar عنه, he breaks the backbone of the second largest empire, uh, superpower of the day, the Persians, the Sassanid Empire. This is, a, this is amazing. This is يعني, out, of, out of this world. And the Roman Empire continued. By that time, by the time of Umar, Persia, that's it, came to a stop. The Persian Empire came to a full stop. The Roman Empire was stopped, was continued to have dominance over many parts of the world, including, of course, today's Turkey. Because the, 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 the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire was in Istanbul, Constantinople, Constantinople until when? 1453, until when Sultan Muhammad or Muhammad al-Fatih, he went there 1453. This is un the, until then, the Roman Empire was still going. The Persian Empire stopped by the time of Umar anhu, right? But the Roman Empire had weakened. It had weakened, and with the rise of the Ottoman Empire, they definitely put a massive stop to the further expansion of the Roman Empire. So I wanted to put all of that in context, because now in the desert, in the middle of the desert, there is nobody around, and, who, and even, I mean, the Arabs hadn't even gone out of Arabia yet. He says to this nobody, <laughs> to this Salat bin Malik, who was a nobody, he says to him, how would you feel when you wear the bracelets and the crown, in other narrations, and the crown of Kisra, <laughs> the, the, the emperor of Persia? He couldn't respond because he doesn't know what to respond. <laughs> so, what, what do you say? <laughs> what do you say? Sahih, you, you imagine. I think if it was you, it's like, huh? What? What are you even talking about? So, Umar, it is says during the time of Umar, uh, Umar bisawari kisra, da'a suraqa bin Malik. Allah. Now we said fast forward to the time of Umar when the bracelets and the crown and the jewelry of Kisra were now in Medina. 
when Umar saw that, the bracelets, he says, call Suraqa bin Malik. He said, call him. Uh, uh, and he said, here, wear it. This is what Rasulullah Sallallahu promised you. Ajeeb. It is just, it's, it's just, it's just amazing, right? And they said uh, about Suraqa, كان سراقة رجلا أزب يعني كثير الشعر الساعدين وقال له ارفع يديك فقال الله أكبر الحمد لله الذي سلبهما كسرى بن هرمز الذي كان يقول يعني كسرى أنا رب الناس وألبسهما سراقة بن مالك and then when he said here take it عمر عمر didn't keep it even for he didn't give it to anybody else he said this is yours this is a prophecy of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and Suraqa said, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, who took them from Kisra and gave it to this man, Suraqa bin Malik. Kisra, who used to say, Ana Rabbina, I, I am the Rabb of people. Kisra used to say, like, like Fir'aun. And, Allah, and, and, and he gave it to Suraqa bin Malik uh, bin Ju'sum, and he said to him, Take it. And Umar raised his voice. وَرَفَعَ بِهَا عُمَرْ صَوْتَهُ ثُمَّ أَرْكَبَ السُّرَاقَ He says, ride the horse and take these and go around and with a loud voice say what Rasulullah Sallam told you. That he said that you will get the, the bracelets of, of Kisra and that you have it. And say, and he went around and said, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, who, who gave the, the bracelets of the emperor of Kisra to Suraqa bin Malik. And commenting that, you know, some historians, they say, I mean, imagine this. This is Surah Al Malik was a nobody, really. And now, but but it tells you something else: the absolute submission of the Sahaba radiyallahu to what Rasulullah sallallahu said. Although although Rasulullah sallallahu did not say give, he didn't. When he said to Suraqa, he said, remember he said, "Kaifa bika il? How do you feel when? What do you think when?" the bracelets of Kisra are given to you. That's all he said. He didn't say, go back and tell everybody that I said that one day you will, the, the Persia will be destroyed and we will have the, the, the treasures of Kisra and that they, make, they should make sure that they give it to you. He didn't say any of that. Rasulullah said, all he said, he said, how would you feel? What do you think will happen when you will be wearing the bracelets of the emperor of Kisra? And when the khalas, that's it, the Sahaba knew what that meant. It meant it's going to happen. And it happened. And it happened. And he gave it to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَسُبْحَانُ مُقَلِّبُ الْقُلُوبِ يعني Allah Azza wa Jal is the turner of hearts. One of the lessons from this is الثبات على الحق. You be firm on what is true on Haq and leave, them, leave it to Allah. Leave the hearts of people to Allah. And you don't know those who, are, who seemingly are your worst enemy can become suddenly your supporters. And you see this again, again, and again in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? You see it again and again and again. You just stand on the Haq. You be steadfast, you be firm. And you don't control, we don't control people's hearts. Allah Ta'ala controls people's hearts. And you see in the case of Suraqa, how he wanted to go and kill Rasulullah Sallallahu and capture him rather. And that was it. Not, I mean, yes, he got a gift of the, he got a, a great gift of the treasures of the bracelets of Kisra. But the greater gift of all was Hidayah that he got. That is the bigger gift that he got. So when Rasulullah Sallallahu then proceeded because Suraqa had left him and Rasulullah then made it. Now remember the people of Medina were awaiting the coming of Rasulullah Sallallahu and most of them uh, the Ansar uh, had not seen him. Right? Some have seen him made bay'ah with him if you recall the two bay'ahs and they went back and gave da'wah for a year almost before Rasulullah came, Mus'ab bin Umayr and others. 
And so Mus'ab and few people saw Rasulullah but many of the people of Medina had not seen him so they don't know who he is yet. But as we have seen, as we have heard, most, in fact, Islam had already entered every house in Medina before Rasulullah had come because of the effort and the da'wah of few young people, men and women. So there was an anticipation of the arrival of Rasulullah sallallahu So what they would do, the people of Medina, every day, they knew he was on his way, but they didn't know when he will arrive exactly. You know, they didn't have WhatsApp and, <laughs> you know, hey, I'll be arriving in one hour, inshallah, right? <laughs> they, so they didn't have any of that. They're anticipating the arrival. So every day they would come out and out, outside and look. And they'd say they'd stay until midday. When it got very hot, then they went back. Uh, they were humans, you know, it got really hot. You know, Mecca and Medina in, mashallah, in summer is yani, <laughs> very hot. Even, even the people of Mecca and Medina can't handle it. Which reminds me quickly of a story, again, during the Khilaf of Umar uh, uh, that uh, Uthman narrates this, Uthman says, I, it was a very hot day and sometimes when you get the sandstorm, it gets even much more difficult, right? Uh, and so he says it was a sandy day and very, Uthman narrates, he said it was a very sandy day and it was a very, very hot day. So everybody went inside their houses in the shade of their own houses. And he said, I wanted to just look outside. And they had, some of them had like little win small windows on the door. So he said, I just opened to look outside and I could see somebody coming from far. Uthman says, But I couldn't notice, notice who he was or who he or she was. So I waited. And I, as the person was coming closer, I could see he's trying to cover himself from the sand. And as he came closer and closer, I could see that he had a sheep with him also. And I became more curious as to who this person is, and very quickly I realized this is Umar radiallahu anhu, Amir al So he said, I shouted out, Oh Umar, come inside, it's very hot and very sandy. Umar says to Uthman, you stay inside, because on the day of Qiyamah, Allah is not going to ask you about this sheep, He will ask me about it. It was of the Bayt al-Mal, the, of the property of the community that had fled or escaped or was lost and he went to look for it. Right? So when they used to come out every, every day and stay till midday and they go back and even the Jews of Medina at the time also were, everybody was, you know, the feeling, the anticipation. So they said there's one of the Jewish people and this is, and, and they had some forts, some of them had husn, uh, forts. And he said he would, sometimes you see in the movies that they climbed a palm tree, but Allah alam that that, but they, he said they climbed a wall. Anyway, and he, then he could see, this Jewish man actually is the first to see them coming, and he could see from afar people coming, but could not distinguish, but he immediately realized it's them. So he called out and he says, this is Jaddukum, <laughs> this is your elder who has come. And quickly, the people, this is not, this is still outside of Medina, not exactly in Medina, this is where Quba is today. Right, if anyone has been for, to Medina and you've been to, for Hajj or Umrah, you know, you go to Masjid, Masjid Quba. And so they went to meet him, alayhi salatu wassalam, there, uh, uh, and they were uh, very excited. Uh, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam sat down, and Abu Bakr is the one who actually stood and was speaking to the people. And because many of those did not know Rasulullah they thought Abu Bakr was Rasulullah because he was the one speaking. But then when the sun was, uh, when the sun came closer to Rasulullah and sort of was on his face, Abu Bakr went and sheltered Rasulullah At that moment they knew that the man who was sitting was Rasulullah and Abu Bakr, he, he sheltered him with his cloth to cover his to cover him from the sun, alayhi salatu uh, And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa stayed in, uh, in fi Bani Amru bin Awf bid'a ashra, ashrata layla. He stayed about a week, a week and a half or so. And this is where uh, he built, or the, he built the first masjid outside of Medina, and that is Masjid Taqwa, which Allah tabarak ta 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 refers to in the Quran. 
uh, a masjid that is built on taqwa, uh, which became Quba. Then after that, he went to Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when they saw him come to Medina, uh, they said the men and the women, many of them went on the roofs of, on, on the roofs of their houses. They, many of the children came out and some of the men came out to receive him, alayhi wa sallam. And they had all put their best clothes on. It was then like a Eid. It was the most beautiful moment for them to receive Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, according to the, uh, the most sound, most sahih narrations, that the only thing that they were saying is that, uh, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah. You know, it has become customary that people think that when he came to Medina, uh, the people of Medina started to say, Tala al-Badr alayna min thaniyat al-Wada'a to the end, you know that nasheed. And there is no evidence for this. Not only there is no evidence, the ulama say actually, if you look at the words of the, the song or the nasheed, you know that it is inaccurate because geographically, Thaniyat al-Wada' is from the north, but Rasulullah was coming from Janub, the south, right? And so the song says, Tala al-Badr alayna, the, the common understanding is that they said, Tala al-Badr alayna, Al-Badr is the moon crescent, the, or the full moon rather, the full moon, meaning Rasulullah had appeared among us. Min Thaniyat al-Wada' from Thaniyat al-Wada' is a, a location. He appeared to us from that location. But that location in this nasheed is actually towards Sham, uh, which is north from, from Medina. But Rasulullah was coming from the Janub, from the south. And so people, you know, the scholars who looked at this, they say, therefore, uh, it is not possible nor accurate that they would have sung Qala al-Badru alayna. But they were joyous and they were saying, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, وروى الإمام مسلم بسنده قال عندما دخل رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم صعد الرجال والنساء فوق البيوت وتفرق الغلمان والخدم في الطرق ينادون يا محمد يا رسول الله يا محمد يا رسول الله إمام مسلم رحمة الله عليه إن هز صحيح مسلم هي سيز that when نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم entered مدينة the men and the women ascended the, the rooftops of their houses and the children and the servants went out in the pathways and they were saying Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad Rasul, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah and this was a, the most joyous occasion for the people of Medina they say the most joyous occasion was his arrival Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the most saddest of all occasions for them was when he de departed, when he died alayhi salatu was salam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then he uh, uh, stayed in, in, Dar, in the house of uh, Abi Ayyub al-Ansari for a while until, uh, and then he went, went and bought, uh, bought a piece of land from two orphans. Uh, to build the Masjid al Nabawi, which became now the Masjid al Nabawi. The two orphans initially said, It's a hiba, we give it to you as a gift, O Rasulullah, this piece of land. But he insisted that he pays them for it, alayhi salatu salam. And that is his beautiful habit, as he did with Abu Bakr, if you recall, when Abu Bakr said to him, I have prepared two camels, when he came and asked him for suhba to migrate, Abu Bakr said, I have been preparing for this for the last six months. And here are two camels, one for you and one for me. Rasulullah says, Bithamanihi, you get you, I'll pay you for it. And now when he uh, asked for the land of these two orphans to, because this is where his camel uh, stopped, alayhi salatu salam, he said, I will build the masjid here. They said, we'll give it to you as a gift, alayhi salatu salam. And he said, no, be, I will pay you for it. Uh, and he did. And the first thing, therefore, Rasulullah sallallahu did to establish this new Islamic, you know, it's hard now to translate. <laughs> when you translate to Islamic state, now it's quite scary, right? <laughs> but you know what I mean? You know, it was the dawla, they said, you know, the nation, the Islamic nation, maybe that's a better, <laughs> when he wanted to establish the Muslim Islamic nation, the first thing he did, was build the masjid alayhi salatu which is a beautiful practice which the Islamic civilization continued to do 
until today. Wherever they went, Muslims first established a masjid because it is the ruh, it is the soul and the backbone of the community, including the Afghan camellias, when your ancestors, when the Afghan camellias came here in the 1850s, the first thing they did, masjid. And if you look at, uh, and I'll finish inshallah, I did say nine o'clock, if you look, if you look at uh, traditional Muslim cities, you look at Fez, if you go to Morocco, Tunisia, or, or Palestine, or Egypt, or any of these cities, often before they built a city, they built a masjid. Always the masjid, and then everything came around. Barakallah feekum, jazakumullah khair. I think we'll stop here before you start screaming and shouting at me. Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, inshallah ta'ala. Next Friday, I won't be here. I'll be in Canberra, so if you want to come to Canberra, we can do the seerah there. <laughs> but after that, no travel. I promise we'll be with you, inshallah ta'ala. There is no other travel uh, until the end of the year. So one more, that's it. <laughs> so, But we'll see you uh, for, again, Umrah class or seminar on Sunday at 10 o'clock. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashallah ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.